I'm not Shane Willard. I am not Shane Willard at all. But he and I, he is like, I wish he was here around because he is one of the dearest people in my life. And we got to talking a little about end times. And I began to think a little about end times. Well, I guess I've always thought a little about end times. Is that I don't know when end times is. And you know what? And that's okay because Jesus said he didn't know when it would be. But I do know this. That there is a period, let, let, let's, let's read something, because we, we're going to pick up a little bit and read a scripture that we read last week in 1 John chapter, 18, or chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, John, the 90-year-old prophet. How many of you know that all of these men of God thought that Jesus was going to come back before they died? How many of you know that they all thought, does everybody, is everybody kind of in agreement with that? They all thought that Jesus was going to come back before they died. Then why do we read the scripture that's going to happen? I don't know. But this is what John's thinking is. Little children... It is the last time. John's 90. And guess what to John? It's getting close to the last time for him. Right? I know this. I heard someone say this last night. It was was the most sweet thing. We had this great time for you all that don't care. It wasn't it it great, Sandy? It was really, really, really awesome. I think I scared them off when I said it was like Southern Gospel. It really wasn't. There was some. There was, I mean, but it was really, really good. But I had someone walk up to me, and he said this. He said, I know I'm going to die soon. I know that. He said, but my job is to plant seeds everywhere I go. He said, I know that I'm going to die. I know, and I just talked to uh, Dr. Wright this past week. He said, I know I've got more days behind me than I do ahead of me. But I've still got work to do. So this person last night said, I just need, I know this. He said, I just feel this need that I gotta sow something out there and I gotta plant seeds out there so that when I plant seeds out there, guys like you can water it. And I thought, oh my goodness, how profound that was is that he is in his, what? Last days, whatever those days look like. We know this, but John says this. It is the last time. As you have heard that the Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. We won't go back and revisit that message from last week. I can't replicate it because it was so good. Anyway, whereby we know that it is the last times. We know that it is the last time. You see, we've got something in our mind that has been developed from the 90s. From this awesome literary collection that turned onto a movie that said that there was going to be planes where pilots are going to leave everybody to die in the plane and cars driving down the road and all of a sudden they look in there and there's just clothes in there because a person left. This, this, like this, one thing that we have built end times on. We've got this thought in our mind that this is just how Jesus is just going to do that. But when John looked at this this last times, he's thinking, hey, listen, there's some things going on, but I want you to know something. This is not later on. John is talking in the thoughts of this is the last day. Well, let's look at another scripture. Maybe. First Peter chapter 1, verse 20. God chose him, Jesus, as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these last days. All of a sudden, there's this thought that maybe the last days are beginning when Jesus was revealed. 
And maybe those last days and the thought of the last days wasn't necessarily a prophetic thing. Maybe it was is that uh, John looks at this group of people and said, hey, these are your last days. This is what it is. And and remember, we're not trying to read the scripture for who's right or wrong. But what has happened in the scripture that's doing something in you? I don't want to say that I want to... speak as a heretic or anything. I want us to look at the scripture and begin to consider if Jesus doesn't come back tomorrow and you die tomorrow, this is your last day. This one theologian, this awesome uh, theologian, Benny Hill said one time, he said, he said, live your life as if it's your last day because one day you will be right. Be in this. And so, so we're looking at scripture here and it begins to tell us because we think and we feel like we're looking for something as opposed to looking at our own lives. I know by statistics speaking and by what average age of men live that I have more days behind me than I do in front of me. So when I'm looking at my life and I'm saying I'm into my latter days, I don't plan on going anywhere in the next four or five years, but I I plan on, well, I might be halfway there. But I know this, that I need to live, and we need to live as if it is the last day. Let's look at something else. Let's look at uh, this next verse in Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2 has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he has made the worlds. He, they, this, this, the, the writer here is telling us is that he spoke by the prophets in the last time, but he all of a sudden revealed Jesus. Remember in John chapter one, God became flesh yeah, or the word became flesh and the world, word dealt among us and, and, and came around about us and lived with us. Let's say it right. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Is that we've got to begin to recognize as there was a revelation of the word of God. And when there began to be a revelation of the word of God, it began to say, say hey, this is the start of something new. Because Jesus declared it to be right. Because in his first ministry, stick with me, we'll go somewhere here in a minute, and I know it's messing with some of your theology. Jesus said, you've got to repent and change your mind for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said, you've got to move over and there's something new happening and there's some things that are going to be passing away. If we get to the place in our life where we begin to live like we are truly living in the kingdom, then some things are going to change. Some lives are going to change. If we honestly and truly live by that, we are, there are some things that are honestly going to change. And we've got to begin to be those people that begin to say, I know that I've got to live for God as if it is the last days. Because I know this, in the Old Testament, it tells us what's going to happen. Because in Joel chapter 2, He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days, God says, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream, uh, see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. He said this is going to happen in the last days. When did it happen? After the resurrection of Jesus. All of a sudden we began to say there's an, an inauguration of the last days of where we are. Because we can honestly say that we are in what has already been told the last days because in those last days, he did pour out his spirit for us. And we've got to begin to live like we know that we are filled and we are moving in his spirit. We have to acknowledge, just move, just move down. We've got to begin to acknowledge what God is saying. And we've got to stop looking for that one single day and live our lives as if it is the last days. Because I can honestly look at you and I can say this. How many of you in here believe it's the last days? The Lord did that to me. Can I tell you what he did to me? I won't say it to you. This is just what he did to me when I did it. So don't take offense to it. He did it to me. Okay, don't don't take offense to this. The Spirit of the Lord in prayer 
and looking for this, this thing in this, this scripture. You know, I, I want to I have a point in our, in our sermons and what we were doing. The Lord hit me. Now, this is, this is, this is for me, not for you, okay? okay? Because he said, do you really believe it's the last day? I said, yeah. Now, if we get into the last day, we may differ greatly on that, but we won't go there today. We'll go there at a different time. And this is what the Spirit of the Lord said to me. You must be the most uncaring, unloving, ungrateful person to ever walk the earth. And I said, what? Holy Spirit. And I wouldn't say that to myself. You must be the most unloving, uncaring, unthankful person to ever walk the earth. And I thought, Holy Spirit, you gotta clear this one up. Because if you truly felt like it was the last day, you would go and grab every lost person. Every, you would go and you would break every wall. You would break down every, you would break every division. You would heal every hurt. You would do the, if you were truly in belief that it is the last day. I said, I get it. I get it. Because if you, and, and I, know, I know you didn't do this, but if you raise your hand, but I know uh, um, if you think this is the last day, what about that person you come in contact with that doesn't know Jesus? They're on the edge of eternal hell. And we are, in Jesus' words, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the sign of the coming, uh, sign of, the coming of, of the Son of Man. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them away so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. We're, if we believe this is the last day, this wrecked my world, guys. If we believe it's the last days, we're standing on the ark looking down at people who are about ready to die with no compassion and no desire to scream, to, frame, to scream salvation to them. I thought, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. I couldn't imagine if it's the last days celebrating being lifted up or being into a new kingdom with my, my Savior, and looking at somebody I love saying, too bad you didn't say yes. Too bad you let the drugs take you. Too bad. You, you made your choice. You made it. I started praying. I think, oh my gosh. And then, I go through my reels in the morning, my inspirational, my encouraging reels. I saw an old Jimmy Swagger clip. And he was sitting there and he was talking as Jimmy could do. He said, listen, what would you do if you knew tomorrow Jesus was coming back? What would you do? Would you run and you'd tell your children? What would you do? What would you do? Would you, would you pray harder for your loved ones? Would you pray harder for the lost? What would you do if you knew tomorrow Jesus was coming back? 
would you go try to grab somebody out of the fire? And then he said, how do you know he's not coming back tomorrow? And when we live our lives, when we, as Jesus said, eat, drink, get married, and have all those things, and get married, and, and give in marriage, and all of those things, but yet we lose we lose the joy of salvation because we're holding on to things. We're holding on to things. That's a prophetic song. We're holding on to things. I know you got to get, I know you need to get pulled out of the fire as Jude said. Jude said there are some that you, that you rescue by pulling them out of the fire. I, I know you need to get pulled out of the fire, but I got my stuff. I, I, man, I'm so sorry you made the decision, but I got my stuff. I know you're, you're going down for the last time, and I know, I know, I know it's hell. Sorry. It may not have been your last days. It might have not have been the last day of the church, but maybe it's their last day. You see, we get so caught up and the prophetic of the last day. And the last day wonders. And you know what apocalypse really means? Google apo uh, apocalypse. Shame, but now we're talking about that. Google apocalypse and pull up images. It shows you like all these like gory things and crazy stuff. It really just means the beginning of something. It means the beginning of the kingdom of God. That people began to say that we are no longer going to be bound to the things of this world. We're no longer going to be holding our stuff. We're no longer going to be grabbing our stuff. John had a mindset that this is not a prophetic word for way down the road. It's a prophetic word to speak into the lives of the people that read this. That say if you continue to live like this, that you're going to suffer the loss. You're going to mess up something and you're going to miss. And you have the possibility. What would be worse? You missing heaven or your loved ones, your children missing heaven? I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to miss heaven either, and I'm not going to. I am not going to. But by golly, I don't want my kids doing it either. And you know what? Is it the last day? Are we going to hold on to the lies of the enemy and say, this is what? I, got, I will prophetically speak to you when the last day is. Okay? Prophetically. God knows. And he'll tell us when he wants to. But if we genuinely look, if we genuinely look and we begin to say, God, how do I know? This is, the, this, is, this, is this next scripture. It's like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Now again, I'm under the opinion all of these guys thought Jesus was coming back. All of these guys thought they were talking about the last days right before Jesus came. Then, they had no thought. They wanted to hold on to the end. In those last days, the perilous times will come. But because it happened in their lives, it could be happening in ours. And maybe, just maybe, as we read... For men will be lovers of themselves. Sorry. Lovers of money. Oh, no, no. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Oh, Lord, my goodness. I can tell you I wasn't disobedient to mine. You know why you know? I'm still alive. <laughs> or I still got all my teeth. Unthankful. Unholy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Was that not an awesome message that Brian talked to us about last night? Slanderers. We don't hear that, do we? 
We got a political system that's not built on what somebody's going to do for the country. It's just built on how bad the other person is. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, or traitors, headstrong, huh, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I mean, they're coming to church and they're denying, denying the power. What is the power? Paul said it this way in the book of Romans. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe, first the Jew and then to the Gentile. What he's saying, he said, there's going to be people that are going to deny the good news, the power of the good news. I'm here to declare that there is goodness in the good news. There is power in the good news. When you begin to recognize, when you begin to declare it over your life, there is power. That you live. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues, casting out devils, and all that other stuff. That is the accessory to knowing the saving grace of the power of salvation that comes only through the Word of God. And who is the Word? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It is Jesus that He is the Word. So when we begin to get the Word into our lives and we begin to change, we can't deny the gospel, that salvation gospel that we should be pre the preaching. We should, the, the, oh, well, here's the thing that we look at nowadays. I'm saved, so what's, me, my, four, no more. Come on, let's go do something. No, we've got to begin to get back into that place and say, hey, it's, it's the Word of God that's going to bring salvation to this world. It's the Word of God that's going to launch salvation in this world. And we cannot deny it. And from such people, turn away. Turn away from the people. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the people that are, that are sitting there saying, oh, that we believe in Jesus, we all this, but we're going to do it our way. No, we got to get into that place where the word of God transforms us and changes us and makes us a new creation. Begins to move into us something new. The power of God, denying the power of God is just basically denying the power of salvation in your life. Having a form of godliness, but benign, but denying the power. I, I look like I am. I look like I am. But if I was really transformed by the salvation and the saving grace of God, I want everybody to know the good news of Jesus. I want everybody to know who saved me, who lifted me up, who took me and broke away all of those things. I want somebody, and I know that this, this message, I know that there's people wrestling with the thought of what we're talking about today, but I'm not trying, trying to talk to you about the end day. You know why? Because it's so controversial. I'm talking about your end days. I'm talking about what your days are. What are you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be? Because it rea honestly is in reality is that, do you really think it is the end times? And we've answered that question. I don't think we do. Because if we really genuinely think it's the end times, we're playing Russian roulette every single day. If we really think it is the end, day, end days and the end times that we're playing Russian roulette, you know what, I don't have, I, I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to do that. I don't want you to do it. I want us to go into the book of Esther real quick because I want us to look what happened here. Esther was this, was this woman, she's a Jewish woman, that found favor in the king. He was a, he was a king and uh, the king wanted a wife and she was beautiful. She was awesome. And we love to quote this scripture. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? And then they would shorten it to, how do you know you weren't made for such a time as this? And we think that is so cool and that is so good and that, that Esther was doing everything that was right and everything that was good. And, and she was living life and she was doing good. And I want to tell you that is not what is happening in this circumstance. Esther was living a, a, the wife of a king. And this king hooked up with this guy named Haman. And this guy named Mordecai, they, the, this guy named Haman said, hey, we're going to make everybody bow to us. Everybody honor us. And Haman, and Haman went to the king and said, King, we're going to make this rule. Whoever, now I'm going to bring this in to the end times, okay? So don't, I'm not losing you, I hope. And he said, whoever, we need, to, we need everybody to bow when I come around. Haman had an ego problem. And so, he said, so, so this guy named Mordecai was, uh, was, was a Jew. Well, when Haman came around, Mordecai made his stand. Mordecai made his stand and said, no, I'm not bowing. 
It infuriated this ego-driven, egomaniac Haman. He goes to the king and he says, King, we've got to make this, we've got to make this rule. We've got to do this. And we've got to say, whoever doesn't bow down to us, who doesn't ever give in to us. Now, I want to get you to understand something. Haman and the king were a form of government. Government was controlling what was being done. Hmm. What was happening and what's happening now because of that? But anyway, uh, the government was in control, but Mordecai was making a stand. Well, the government didn't like the stand, and I'm going to tell you something. The, the government does not like the stand of the Christian church. It can be any other kind of church, any other, and they won't bother you. But the Christian church, they don't want it. This was the children of God. We know that the children of Israel, the Jews, were God's special people. So I'm going to bring this along, and I'm going to say this is a kind of a type and a shadow of what the church is. Is See, the government is in control, and they're trying to tell us what to do. And they are causing us to bow down to them but because they are controlling us. And I know this is, I'm not Nick either. I'm not getting into political stuff. But what I am going to tell you, I'm going to get into what is happening in our world today to the church. And they are wanting us to be controlled and bow down. And if we don't, then they're going to come after us. Because Haman went to the king and said, hey, we want to go. And so the king said, whatever you want to do, okay, here's my ring and you can put my seal on it. So Haman said, okay. The twelfth month of the last, or the thirteenth day of the last month, we're going to kill all the Jews. We're going to get rid of all the Jews. And so Mordecai gets wind of this. Okay, he hears that this thing is being is happening, and you see, I am one hundred percent convinced this country would love the Christian Church to shut down and shut up. I don't know that it necessarily wants us to shut down as much as it just wants us to shut up. It wants us to be quiet. Well, Mordecai had made this stand and, and, and he knew they were coming after him. So he goes in, in, in Esther chapter 4 and we're going to look at what happened because it happened. In Esther chapter 4, because uh, I want you to know because we're going to take it from the end times to end time. Because Esther was in her time. And I wanted to tell you that you are in your time. Because everybody, everything's going to come against you to try to shut you up, but it is in your time. In Esther chapter 4, verse number 1, it says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud, boy, loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate. He wasn't going to be shut up and denied. See, this is what's going to take for the church to begin to say, hey, something has got to change. The problem with it is, is that we are so afraid of Haman. We're so afraid of the government. We're so afraid. And we're not even necessarily afraid of the government. We're afraid of the person next to us and worrying about what they're going to say to us. We're afraid what it's going to look like on Facebook. We're afraid we're not going to get a like on Facebook, a heart on Facebook, a smiley face on Facebook. We're worried more about that stuff than what is truly happening here so what is happening here he said listen he said i'm going to go to the king's gate i'm going to step up and i'm going to begin to stand up and i'm going to stand against it he goes on to say oh jesus on the main line <laughs> for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth he said they ain't gonna tell me what to do they are not going to tell me what to do. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews. You see, there's people out there that we don't even know that are seeking God and praying and believing for God and, and saying, hey, we got to do something. We think, we believe that maybe we're making a stand, but we're by ourselves. It's happened throughout. Elijah, he thought he was by himself. And God said, no way. I've got 7,000 guys hid away for you that never bowed down. There's other people out there. You see, there are things that keeps our mouth shut because we think that we're against it by ourselves. I have to tell you that God has prepared people that are ready to stand up and believe. There was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. 
in order to face what we're facing now is we've got to begin to put on a time of prayer. And I'm not talking about a time of prayer. Thank you, God, for my food. Bless you. I pray that's my prayer life. I'm not talking about, I'm not even talking about just being out here on Tuesday night and believing with us and praying with us. I'm talking about we've got to get to the place where these people begin to say, hey, we know that there's an attack against our people and against what we're doing. And we and listen, this is serious. They're coming out. Let me tell you something, my, my brothers and sisters. If you really believe it's the end times, it is the end times. If you want to believe it is, then you better get to praying and believing because there's got to be some praying and believing because we're not going to overcome this outside of prayer and belief. We're not going to defeat an enemy without getting up and believing that God is going to communicate with us and give us direction. And the only way we knew that is that we pray. But these people began to say, hey, we're going to be torn apart. You see, we don't even have enough gumption to get up and pray and seek to turn off the television to walk away from, walk away from uh, things that have our attention all the time that we know we don't need in our life in order to pray and seek God's face. But we want God to do something. I love you. But we're going down, maybe. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. She is a Jew. So you know she is distressed because all the people are going to be killed. No, she's not. So then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai. She, she's upset because Mordecai is standing out making a scene and praying and standing against the enemy. Because she is living a lush life. We all want to say that, oh, this is wonderful and this is great. And it turns out to be a good story for the children of Israel. For us. I, I, I get it, for Mordecai especially. But her first thought was, how can we hide him crying out and praying? You see, that's the problem in the church today. They pray, show up at Tuesday night. They pray at 6.30. They leave at 7.30. You don't want to pray out there to go to Mark parking lot. Don't, don't cry out. Don't stand on the street corner and cry out. It's the church doing that. It's the church doing that. Because this is what happened. Was that she, was, she was trying to get him to be quiet. She said she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him. But he would not accept them. You see, we've got to have some men and women of God that finally get up and say, hey, I've had enough of it. I'm not shutting my mouth. I'm not turning my stuff off. I'm going to begin to be a man or woman of God. I'm going to stand against the powers of the enemy. I'm not going to let this thing come into my school. I'm not going to let this stuff come into my life. I'm not going to let abortion take my, another child. I'm going to stand in the middle of the street, and I'm going to find out if I'm the only one that I'm going to die screaming out that I'm the only one. But I promise you, if some people will begin to get it in their heart and begin to say, I'm going to step out, and I'm going to make a stand, and I'm not going to shut up because everybody else told me, because Haman told me he would kill me. The government said they'd shut me down. Everybody, Facebook said they'd turn me off to Facebook. So what? I was preaching the gospel before Facebook. People were getting saved before Facebook. People's lives were changing before Facebook. I don't care. I love it because we can touch people's lives, but I don't need it because right now we need Jesus more than we need Facebook. We need a move of God, and we are not going to get it by sitting simply walking around and saying, I'm living with the government. I'm doing it by the government's rule, and I'm going to. And this is what he said. This is what he said. Said uh, to Esther, uh, Mordecai told him an answer to Esther. He said, "Don't you think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews?" And this is what the Lord spoke to me. Is do you forget who you were? You forget who you were. You think that there's there's you think there's government. You think there's people out there that are Christians that are in things we don't agree with? You think they'll be there if, if they're able to shut us down, shut our mouths? No. Because we can't have an agreement with the world and satisfy the world and make a change for Jesus. More than that, make a change for our lives. Because Jesus has given us the ability to walk in his kingdom and make the changes and make the difference. He's already done all the work. We gotta carry it out. Jesus did all the work. But he goes on to say this. Verse number 14. 14. Can you maybe, I'm going to throw this thing against the wall. 
I remember that part of me is not saved. For if you remain completely silent, if you remain completely silent, and my brothers and sisters, the church hasn't been silent in the church. We'll praise him and worship him in the church. But what about our voices outside? Because here's the most important thing that Mordecai had to point out here. If you remain silent, completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews. God will still raise somebody up. It's not doom and gloom. It's not... (laughs) God's still gonna raise somebody up. Folks, I gotta tell you, he wins. I gotta tell you, he wins, he wins, he wins. You're gonna win, we're gonna win. We gotta get on that side. We gotta begin to say, I know that I'm with a winner. I know that I'm gonna come and I'm gonna be with a winner. And what happens when I'm a winner? With a winner, I get to be on the winning team. I get a ring too. I get, yeah, I got a robe too. I got the coat, the jacket, and everything else. I got a crown that tells me I'm on the winning team. I don't want to not be. Because this is the worst part about this, my brothers and sisters. And I hope it's a challenge to you, it's a challenge to me. It's a challenge to me as I was writing this message. I thought, well, I got another message that I didn't do a couple weeks ago that I could do. And the Lord wouldn't let me. So... He dumped on me, I'm dumping on (laughs) y'all. Relief and a deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place. But listen to what the words say next. But you and your father's house will perish. I don't want our houses to perish. I don't want our houses to perish. I don't want our houses to perish because we're worried about the end times for ourselves, and we're, we, we want to know we want to know that day and that hour. And you know why I know why we want to know that day or hour? There is no question why we want to know that day or hour. So I can have some fun right up until that, and I can go ahead and make the change that day before. Come on now. If you knew the day, you knew the hour. You'd be, okay, I, I can ask, because I know people right now, I've talked to people, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask the Lord in my life, uh, you know, at, when I get older. You know, might do it on my de- deathbed. Well, some people don't get a deathbed. And Mordecai is sitting here telling Esther, he said, listen, God's still gonna do something. The bridge, God's still going to do something. I said, God's still going to do something. If he doesn't do it here, he'll raise somebody else up and he will do it. But maybe our house will fail. Our house will not die. And listen, I don't want it to. I don't want your house to fail. I don't want your house to be lost. I don't want your children to be lost. I want the victory of Jesus to be a lineage that you hand down from generation to generation. I want your children to know the victories of God. I don't want your silence. I don't want your quietness to lead to the destruction of the future of your lives. I don't want it to be that because just as Mordecai said to Esther, as he finished this, he said, who knows? Who knows, Bridge? Who knows if perhaps you were made, queen or king or prince, you were made for just such a time as this. How many of you know that I've already told you, I know you were created for a time such as this. I know you were. You know why I know you are? You're here. 
Because he wrote your days in a book way before the foundations of the world. He knew before that. He said, this is going to be their time. Are we going to live our time worrying about the end times? Are we going to live end time with what God has called us to do? Are we going to begin to rescue those people when they're out, of, when they're in this flame, when they're in this fire? Are we going to begin to pull them out and say, it's not going to be good, not going to be on my watch. I'm not going to have my hands so full of everything else where I can't reach down and save. Or am I going to really believe this is my end times and I'm ready to do something about it? We've got to get to that place, my brothers and sisters, where God is truly moving. My my buddy Nick. Where I know truly what God is doing in our lives. You didn't, it didn't just happen to be here today. It wasn't a mistake that you were here today. You needed to hear this message. You needed to hear this message because I believe that the children of God have been silent too long. I believe we have been quiet too long. I believe we've been passive too long. I believe we looked at things and we know some things are happening, but we keep our mouth shut because we are living in comfort. We're okay. And we don't care if everybody else is suffering. And I'm going to give you the words that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit said to me. Is that, isn't that the most, the, the most hurtful thing that you can have? Does that make you the most uh, light, unlikely, the unloving person, the unkind person ever? Does that make you so unthankful that you've got so much that you think that I don't need anything else? You, you, you felt the love and the grace of God, but I'm going to keep it for myself. Have we gotten into that place, my brothers and sisters, that we are living like Esther? We're living in the, in the love, lap of luxury, the joys of the world that are going on and we don't care about anything else and we say we do but we we say we do but we deny the salvation power of the living God in our lives where we are supposed to be telling the people about the good news the good news is that Jesus is coming back again some soon whether I rupture your rapture and tell you we're not going up and we're going to build a kingdom here or you go whatever it is Jesus is coming back and the good news is everybody that bows and everybody that points a knee and they're bows a knee to him and looks at him and says God forgive me he is bringing salvation and deliverance to us all he is coming back we've got to live like he's coming back we've got to live like this is the last day we've got to declare it we've got to, we've got to worry about it. there is a saying in my life that, again you've heard the story but I'm going to tell you it again six months before my sister died she was 27 years old 27 But in her last days, six months before she was killed by a drunk driver, because she'd heard the good news and knew she came to her bubby and said, I don't ever want to go to hell. And it wasn't a message that I preached to Nancy. It wasn't. Wasn't. It was somebody. Listen, listen to me. How important it is. It was somebody that was at Kroger's in St. Albans that she was walking in. Adam, this is what this person said to her. If you die tonight, do you know if you go to heaven or not? She picked up the phone. She said, Bobby, can I come to your house? I wish she had gotten saved in a message I preached. I said, yeah, baby, you can come to my house. She said, I don't want to go to hell, Bobby. I wasn't pastor. I was Bobby. I said, you don't have to. And we prayed. She found God. She gave her heart to Jesus. In her last days at 27. I don't know if it's your last day. Don't have any idea. I don't know if it's church's last day. But what would you do if it was? Would you finally put those things down? you think 
are so important and say, I need to get right with Jesus? Or are you so bound and determined to play Russian roulette? Maybe, just maybe, this isn't the last day and I have a while. I'm glad that 27-year-old girl didn't make that mistake. She found Jesus. And today she's in the great cloud of witnesses. Listen to Bubby preach and saying, Bubby, you're telling them right. They got to believe the good news is Jesus and Jesus alone. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I don't know this. I don't know if you walk out that door. Matthew run over you with a cart. I had to do something that's getting heavy. I don't know. And the reason why I did that, really, because I don't want you to make an emotional decision. I don't want you to make an emotional decision. I want you to make a decision based upon that you do not want to leave without knowing Jesus as your Lord. You don't want to leave saying, man, he was right. I've been hanging out and everything's good with me and I've watched people die. I know they're probably in hell and I don't know that for sure. We don't know if Jesus, the Holy Spirit didn't give them an opportunity before they died. I don't, I don't know. I prayed that for the boy who killed my sister. I prayed that he had one opportunity that there was something in him that because I he killed my sister, but he's still worth praying that he has the opportunity to be in heaven. I don't want him to go to hell either. I don't want you to. 